of debate on the motion moved by the Minister for Law. Mr. Xia Kianping. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank the speakers before me who have given their views on deliberate online falsehoods. One way to think about today's debate is whether we should adopt a paternalistic or a liberal stance towards false information per se, whether online or off. I think our discussion today suppose that we should first reduce falsehoods as much as we can and second promote the truth as vigorously as we can but as with so much in policy making this is easier said than done deliberate online falsehoods cut across these two broad spectrums completely false information photos or videos purposely created and spread to confuse or misinform Second, information, photos or videos manipulated to deceive or old photos shared as new. More than half of British users of social media surveyed have admitted that they failed to check the original source of online material before sharing or liking it. What about Singaporeans? A June 2017 survey by the Ministry of Comms and Information found that around 25% of respondents shared information that they later discovered to be false. Around two-thirds could not recognize falsehoods when they first saw it, and only half were confident of their ability to recognize falsehoods. Most of us admit that we cannot distinguish the truth from falsehoods. Mr. Deputy Speaker, today I want to make a simple argument that we now need more processes to safeguard the two principles that had underwritten our governance philosophy all these years and which I had spoken about earlier, reducing falsehoods and promoting truth. New processes are needed because the status quo is based on two assumptions which we now know to be questionable. First, the assumption of inf infinite or even adequate time and capacity to process information. There might be one camp choosing to oppose this motion who may think, here we go again, morally coddling us by res restricting information for our sakes. Freedom of information has a nice ring to it, and restricting freedom always requires justification. Don't treat us like little children, they say, unable to distinguish between truths and falsehoods. And indeed, the argument from freedom goes further. Even if we do make mistakes, it is our mistake to make. And so the government should not and should not want to protect us from our mistakes. Surely, it is a fundamental tenet of our democratic system that people should be allowed to make their own decisions. And if those decisions are mistaken, it is a matter of accepting the outcome of a democratic process. That is true. But it is also true that people have a right to expect that the political leaders that they have put in place carry a duty to ensure that their decision-making environment, that is the people's decision-making environment, is not populated by intentional falsehoods. That their leaders not be blind to the dangers that such falsehoods can have on freedom of opinions, religions, races, and genders. Also, it should be noted that we are not restricting fraudulent information. Or rather, that we are not, it should be noted that we are, uh, it should be noted that we are restricting fraudulent information and not restricting information per se. In fact, I see countering falsehoods as a way to safeguard freedom of speech by ensuring the conditions are in place for there to be meaningful and free debate. Falsehoods mislead, crowd out truths, and prevent constructive debate and discourse. Just throwing all the data we have into a pot and then leaving people to distinguish between good and bad information makes the assumption that people have both the time and the capacity to do this. I don't mean capacity in the strict sense of expertise or education. I mean it in the loose sense of inclination or whether we can be bothered. Indeed, most people can't be bothered. Declaring my interest as CEO of NTUC FairPrice, FairPrice too has had its share of online falsehoods. So according to information online, FairPrice, for example, we sell halapok and also we sell plastic rice. In 2007, FairPrice filed a police report after we found a picture of halal pork allegedly sold by stores on the internet. 
If the first person who saw this checked it fast and deleted it, it would have died there. Instead, the news was carried in both the mainstream media as well as online news media and caused a stir in the community, and rightly so. It was so widespread that news had to carry out physical checks. That was in 2007. It went viral again in 2011 and again in 2014. And Fairprice had to respond publicly that this was a 2007 hoax that had resurfaced. Even today, 10 years later, I still get messages asking me about this. So for the last time, I hope, this is a deliberate online falsehood. Indeed, a lie can travel halfway around the world before the truth gets out of pain. And just last year, Fairprice also had to file a police report over viral claims that its house brand Jasmine Fragrant Rice is made of plastic. Last year too, AVA had to step in and come out to debunk a Facebook video that alleged a coffee shop in Amokyo was selling man-made eggs from China. False information will be the Pope's theme for, the, for his annual World Communications Day in 2018. I think if the Pope deemed falsehoods harmful enough to cause polarization of public opinion, all the more should Singapore urgently formulate recommendations to curb the peddling of inf misinformation and the chaos and the additional cost it brings. We know of instances of brands' reputations tarnished by appearing on fake news websites and unwittingly funding their activities. Back in Ma March last year, Harvard Group UK, a media agency, decided to stop all its ad spending on Google and YouTube after ads for its clients ap appeared next to questionable or unsafe content online. Consequences go beyond dollars and cents to the very destiny of men. In the UK, voters for Remain or Exit voted on the basis of information later found to be false. Countries are hoping to sway online citizens to be one way or the other, vote one way or the other, pressure their governments one way or the other, using not evidence or facts, but by casting fear, seeding doubt, and pressing emotional buttons. There are many of us who do not have the knowledge nor the time to see through falsehoods. This is exacerbated by the mode of delivery of such news, how easy it is to like, to comment, or share information these days. We owe a duty of care to the public, by presenting them with straight facts. We owe it to each other to be vigilant of misinformation. We need to be vigilant and alert to decipher masses of information thrown at them. We know this in the same way we know it is bad to eat too much sugar, that exercise is good and sloth bad. We know and yet we do not do what we should. Instead, quite often we do what we should not. So we need the vigilance of laws, regulations and due process. Being vigilant doesn't mean being undemocratic. We need to educate the community, let them know if the news comes from a certified source and equip them to decide whether to read or share. At the same time, we owe it to them, to, the, to ourselves, to ensure that the environment under which such decision-making takes place is as uncluttered with falsehoods as possible. Having regulations and due process also reduces our hiding behind the excuse of honest mistakes. We make claims and then when proven false, we apologize and say we are all human. We did not intend to mislead, to misrepresent, our memories are faulty, blah, blah, blah. Intentions aside, we all know that the consequences matter. Having a review of how we regard such falsehoods will raise the bar for due care in public discourse and also hopefully reduce the instances of being reckless with the truth. We are all imperfect beings and hence we need to show that we have taken due care when we engage in public debates. If Singapore had four seasons, I would say winter is coming. Uh, those who follow Game of Thrones, winter is coming. <laughs> Given that the assumption of infinite time and capacity is false, our first principle must be to reduce falsehoods as much as we can, to be vigilant and guard against the purveyors of such harmful things. So in short, false assumption one, people have in infinite time and capacity to make decisions. And so principle one is reduce falsehoods as much as we can. But there is a deeper objection, Mr. Deputy Speaker, about regulation of information. It argues that the government does not have a right to decide beforehand what is true and what is false. That people have a right to all the facts, and if one set of facts is proved wrong, only then will they decide to change their decisions. 
This is the argument from the marketplace of ideas, that people will change their minds when the facts change. As Cicero, the great Roman orator, said, and I quote him, does not, as fire dropped upon water, is immediately extinguished and cooled. So does not, I say, a false accusation when brought in contact with a most pure and holy life, instantly fall and become extinguished. Cicero, I think, did not have experience with Halapo. The answer to his question, whether falsehoods wither and die when exposed to the light of truth, is, of course, no. Lies thrive and contest against the truth, even when the truth is as evident as where a man was born, was born or the amount of money spent on health care. In the post-truth world, the role of facts, unfortunately, has been shown to have less force than supposed. Instead of changing their minds when presented with a different set of facts, people may instead choose to disregard these facts or find new ways, or find ways to find new facts which support their pre-existing ideas. This confirmation bias is well tested and should be taken into consideration when we make the marketplace argument. So in short, false assumption two, people change their minds when presented with new facts, which leads me to principle number two. We have a duty to ensure to the extent possible that the marketplace of public discourse is not crowded out by falsehoods. To do this, we need to actively invest in any efforts to discern, filter, contain, disrupt, or even punish deliberate online falsehoods. Perhaps the solutions may be both legislative and relying on market forces. First, stronger fact-checking, self-regulation by self-media sites and technology companies. Popular search engines and social media platforms such as Google and Facebook, they have been struggling for years to fight false news despite their best intentions. For instance, in the wake of the Las Vegas shooting last October, Despite Facebook and Google promising to inhibit such circulation, falsehoods such as the identity and the affiliation of the shooter still ran rampant. There is much room for improvement, especially one, one reason is that the algorithm in these systems often bring attention to posts that get their readers' interest. Exactly what falsehoods is designed to do. If the post garnered 10,000 likes and shares, then surely it must be real, right? Wrong. And this is where numbers provide false safety. There's very little wisdom in crowds, or at least very little, that we ought to take at face value when it comes to important decisions. Israel, for example, has proposed legislation requiring social networks to take reasonable measures to monitor their platforms for incitement to terrorism and to remove such incitement or be liable to pay fines. Stronger fact-checking, self-regulation by society, by individuals. It is understandable that many people do not have the time, resources, or energy to recognize and safeguard against falsehoods before believing or sharing with others. Yet, self-policing in this manner is very much dependent on the ability of individuals to spot such news to begin with. Another challenge is the need for individuals to recognize that they need to be socially responsible. Think, think before sharing. This is a moral argument. The limitations to public education now are in its outreach and time. It will be difficult to reach certain segments of the community, such as the elderly. Also, public education of this nature takes a long time before results bear fruit. And we do need some immediate solutions, given the gravity of the situation now intervention through legislation. In the UK, the Culture, Media and Sport Select Committee is conducting an inquiry into fake news. Facebook and Twitter may face sanctions if they fail to hand over information to the committee to assist in a parliamentary investigation into Russian interference in the EU referendum. Some examples of what legislation can do include making falsehood publication a criminal offence mandating the removal of such news from platforms and websites, and or ensuring that readers have access to facts. This achieves the crucial objective of deterrence, which non-regulatory measures mentioned above cannot achieve. The extent of government involvement requires deep discussion. 
heavy-handed legislation may backfire on the government acting as judge, jury and executioner of what constitutes credible information. We may end up freezing free speech online. Legislation, if overly relied on, may also weaken the ability of society to educate themselves and discern what is real or not for themselves. It is clear that the challenges brought by deliberate online falsehoods are many and complex. You will notice, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that I merely challenged these two assumptions and reinforced two principles in the wake of these false assumptions. I stress the role of process in ensuring that the environment for public discourse remains clean and, and, and unencumbered. As to the actual processes themselves, what they should be, how much is needed, I think these are the issues that the Select Committee is best placed to explore, as it allows the committee to draw representations from contributors and stakeholders of all sectors. Having a Select Committee will allow for a thorough discussion of the problems posed by this issue, such as responsibilities of social media and tech companies' platforms, how to educate the public to discern news, the duty that websites have towards using deliberate falsehoods to attract, to attract more hits and to drive rev revenue. In particular, I think such a community would also be able to articulate more clearly and in greater detail the principles that underlie our governance model in terms of regulating information. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I had earlier spoken about the need to balance our freedoms with duties, but perhaps I ought to make it clearer than that. It is not just a balance, but a difference between means and ends. We do not pursue freedom for its own end. We do not, if I, if I may put it bluntly, have a philosophy of freedoms. As Mr. S. Rajaratnam, our then Foreign Minister for Foreign Affairs, said in a speech to foreign correspondents, and I quote him, we see freedom of the press not as the end, but as means to an all-embracing end, the integrity and independence of our country its security, its prosperity, the eradication of anything that would sow seeds of social, racial and religious conflicts, which is the rule rather than the exception in the world today." Unquote. Sir, he was speaking, in, that was in 1986. Yes, more than 30 years ago. And the world has come full circle. So I think we ought to hear his words to the end. He said, let me quote him again, Singapore has far more vulnerabilities than most national states because it has none of the essential prerequisites for a viable, stable and prosperous state. It has nevertheless functioned fairly adequately for 27 years only on the basis of two intangibles, ideas and the human character shaped by these ideas, unquote. Ideas as shaped by human character, not ideas as tossed will linearly into a pot undiscerned, half-formed, half-baked. Let, let, let us all recognize the need to work out for ourselves in Singapore. What is the correct approach towards preventing and combating deliberate online falsehoods? A select committee with the broad terms of reference as proposed in this motion is the best way of working this out. Sir, I support the motion.